We're always talking technical when it comes to aftermarket suspension systems, and we know we lose a lot of you guys. So in this series, we're going back to the basics. In the last episode, we told you guys why shocks won't lift your vehicle if you have something where the springs and the shocks are divorced of each other. In this episode, we're going to tell you guys how to make sure you buy the right length shocks for something that has separate shocks and springs and already has a lift. A suspension lift at its core extends the suspension further, which not only allows you to run longer travel shocks, will necessitate it. If your shocks are too short for the amount of lift on your vehicle, they will not have adequate downward suspension travel, top out constantly, ride harsh, and probably fail relatively quick. On the other side, if your shocks are too long for the amount of lift you have, well, they'll be too far compressed, bottom out two options, and probably will fail just as fast. So, how do you know what length shocks you need? The simple answer is, if you know how much lift you already have, you just choose whichever shocks we list on our website for the amount of lift you already have on your vehicle. But what do you do if you don't know how much lift you have? Well, if you bought somebody else's project or problem, the easiest thing you can do is take measurements of your shocks, which is why we try to list extended and compressed measurements on pretty much every shock we carry for almost every vehicle on the market. Although in a perfect world, we would want you to cycle your suspension to know exactly how much travel we can give you. The easiest way to get it done is to park your vehicle on flat and level ground and then take your measurements from there. On shocks with a stud or stem mount, we are looking to measure from the lowest washer or basically the shoulder at the bottom of the stud as some shocks have a little lip at the top of the body and bottom of the stud. On eyelet mounts, we're looking to measure from center of bolt or center of bolt hole. Same thing with clevis mounted shocks. And on bar pin mounted shocks, you want to measure from basically the center of the loop that the bar pin goes to or basically the center of the bar pin itself. On solid axle applications that generally all have one-to-one -one motion ratios or close enough to it, we are looking to have the shock compressed by 30 to 50 percent of its original extended length while retaining at least three inches of droop travel or four inches of bump travel this means if you're looking at a shock that is 20 inches compressed and 30 inches extended for 10 inches of travel you want your measurements to be somewhere between 25 and 27 inches on independent suspension systems it can get a little bit more tricky because there's a motion ratio or basically ratio between wheel travel and shock travel, but we can calculate this relatively easily. Unfortunately for a lot of you though, it's going to take a little bit more math and measuring. Step one is going to be measuring the distance from the center of the pivot of your lower control arm on the frame to your lower ball joint. The second measurement you're going to need is the distance from that frame pivot again to where your shock mounts from there once you know those two lengths you can divide the length of your control arms by the length between the pivot and the shock mount to get your motion ratio number so if let's say your control arms are 20 inches in total and your shock is mounted 10 inches down that arm you have a two to one motion ratio which means your wheel travel is double your shock stroke let's say you're looking at a five inch stroke shock that is 20 inches compressed and 25 inches extended. For that shock to be perfect for your lift, you would want your ride height measurements to be somewhere between 22 and 23 and a half inches.